A very good morning to everyone. Um, please take your seats, those who are assigned um, places. Let me uh, welcome you all on this Sunday morning after a very intense uh, week. Uh, I so much appreciate that so many of you uh, have prioritized uh, to be with us uh, and uh, I want to thank uh, the World Bank, uh, thank Anna Bierde for uh, the strong partnership we have established on work in fragile and conflict affected uh, states. Uh, the World Bank has been a leading voice for many years, amplifying your concerns and your aspirations. And I am uh, uh, grateful that the bank also helped us uh, at the fund to define our own strategy and to put it into action. Uh, we have representatives of the uh, countries that are most severely impacted by fragility. We have representatives of um, uh, the uh, G7, uh, the intergovernmental organizations. Actually, I should say G7 plus before I say G7. Uh, I am very grateful to the World, the, uh, World Food Program Executive Director, uh, Sidney McCain, for the work you and your staff do and for you joining us uh, today. Uh, also, I want to recognize uh, Assistant High Commissioner Mazu of UNHCR. Here in uh, Morocco, we were able to see firsthand how a natural disaster can shake up communities, but also how a strong foundation of resilience can bring these communities quickly up on their feet. We have been with many of you hand in hand as you build resilience to the fragilities that are impacting your people. I want to extend uh, condolences to all who have been hit by natural disasters and worse, by conflicts, by wars. What we have learned is that fragility not only affects the communities where it takes place, it has often spillovers, often destabilizing neighbors, and that if we do not seriously tackle fragility, fragility whenever it is, there is simply no way for our world to be strong, peaceful, and prosperous. We know that in 2022, 200,000 people have lost their lives in conflicts. More than 108 million people are forcefully displaced. And conflicts today last on average 30 years. This is both a human catastrophe, but it is also a major dent on economic performance. According to our projections, per capita incomes in fragile states will stagnate below their 2019 levels even after next year. This is a lost decade for people who already are in tough place. So why we are here today, we want to listen to you. We want to listen about the aspirations you have, the problems you face, but most importantly, how institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, the World Food Programme, those of us here, UNHCR, 
how can we be a strong uh, force for good standing by you? Uh, I, I want to report to this group that under our strategy that we adopted in uh, 2022, we are taking very concrete action. First, we are putting more staff on the ground and we are building strong partnerships with humanitarian and peace actors under the leadership of country authorities. So we better understand how we can bring support for you. Secondly, we are scaling up capacity development efforts to help you put your fiscal house in order. Despite of the difficulties, raise revenues and improve the quality of public spending. Uh, also, <clears throat> my apologies, I have been talking for a whole week, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, we, we also want central banks to have the strength to bring price stability to support development. Three, we recognize that as a financial institution, we have the responsibility to offer financial support. Uh, we have done it through the food shock window to uh, Ukraine, Haiti, South Sudan, Burkina Faso. And I want to recognize our strong partnership with the World Bank and with the World Food Program and UNHCR. Uh, what we have done is uh, when we don't have our own capacity to reach those that need help, we rely on you. And I want to thank you uh, for that. Uh, we have provided $38 billion to 24 fragile and co conflict affected states since the pandemic started. Much of that support comes from our poverty reduction and growth, trust, interest-free financing, and lending under the trust has quadrupled in the past three years. Uh, thanks to the uh, generosity of our better off members, here in Marrakesh, we reach our target of subsidies, mobilization, and it is a result of across the board effort from advanced economies and also from emerging markets and developing countries. Um, countries as big as uh, the United States and China and as small as uh, Trinidad and Tobago offered a helping hand to the PRGT. Um, I am, uh, my last point is that we are very humble. We recognize that none of our institution on, institutions on its own can bring solutions. But working together, working with you and your friends, we can make a difference for people that are faced with excruciatingly uh, difficult times. Above all, we very much believe that what led to the establishment of our institutions, the uh, Second World War, that brought this realization that peace and prosperity go hand in hand. We are determined to have economic efforts support a pathway to peace. And uh, I am, especially now, we have Minister Marchenko, a country that is uh, affected uh, by, by, by a uh, terrible uh, war. Uh, many of you are experiencing conflicts. I'm actually, I don't need to, I, I'm not gonna uh, name each country because each and every one of you knows the, the horror of conflict. Um, I want to tell you that we all pray but also go beyond praying. We work for peace and stability. Thank you, and now I would pass the floor to Anna uh, Bierde. Anna. Uh, thank you so very much, Managing Director, and good morning, honorable ministers and distinguished guests. 
It's really uh, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here representing the World Bank. And um, uh, this week you will have heard, and we were so happy to have our new vision endorsed. And our new vision is to end poverty on a livable planet. But let me be very blunt. We cannot do this without addressing fragility. And that is because by 2030, we anticipate that close to 60% of the world's extreme poor will be living in countries affected by fragility, conflict, and violence. This means that the World Bank's new playbook that you've also heard about this week will have to be heavily focused on reducing fragility, conflict, and violence. Uh, Managing Director mentioned how fragility, conflict, and violence affects local populations so severely, but it also transpounds boundaries and countries in the form of spillover effects. I saw this firsthand about six weeks ago when I traveled with Filippo Grande from UNHCR to the border of Chad and Sudan. And what we see is a huge influx of people coming from Sudan to Chad. But what we also see is a local community that does not have sufficient development solutions and development support. So one area of fragility that happens again and again is that people on the move, displaced, tend to come to places that are also in need of development, which is why when we craft solutions, we need to think about the people who have been forced to leave and the people who are receiving the populations that are coming in. The um, other issue is that Fragility, conflict, and violence comes on top of so many other intertwined vulnerabilities and risks. Not isolated from the global context, we have seen this in the form of the food insecurity, energy prices, fertilizer prices. We have seen it every day in the form of natural disasters and the impact from climate change. And it's these overlap that makes the situation so much more challenging. We introduced a new strategy in 2020, and I wanted to share with you uh, some uh, lessons and observations that came out of a very recent midterm review that we have done of our strategy. Our strategy focuses on three parts, prevention, resilience, and staying engaged. On the prevention side, we have found that doing diagnostics on the drivers of fragility is very helpful in crafting the buildup and the building of capacity of resilience. We have also been able to leverage resources through the prevention and resilience allocation under IDA, which almost doubles our country envelope for countries that are in fragility and conflict and are vulnerable by allowing to also tap into this resource. On the resilience, we have seen good results when we focus on building the relationship between states and citizens, as well as when we apply filters of gender and climate vulnerabilities to all that we do, because we know drivers of fragility include both the impact of climate, but also the inequalities that many women around the world still face. And on staying engaged, I think we actually have a good track record here. We have realized you have to stay engaged. You cannot wait until a conflict is over. Poverty increases. Institutions erode. You have to stay engaged. So from Haiti to Yemen to Afghanistan, Somalia, of course Ukraine, and now across the Sahel, we are staying engaged. In fact, so much that 25% of our commitments now go to countries that are classified as fragile conflict or uh, in, in vulnerable stage. But we also have identified some challenges in our midterm review. One is uh, how to become more effective on the prevention. We know a lot about it from the Pathways to Peace studies that have been done. We know that for every dollar we put into prevention, we can save $17 in response, yet prevention is complicated and difficult. So we need to double down on understanding and addressing this more. 
Second issue is on delivery models, how to reach mm -hmm. people. And here, again, I really appreciated the remarks uh, because um, we do have to work with partners. We have to work with partners uh, because we cannot always reach. And I heard this in my meetings this week from Burundi to Colombia. So this is something we need to continue to double down on. And in conclusion, I really welcome IMF strategy. I think it's great that we now have a strategy that we can work on between World Bank and IMF because uh, my second point would be that we need to stop also treating these as shocks. We need to actually build in the ability to plan and, and respond from the beginning, which means we have to actually work together at the upstream part. So two strategic elements and instruments will help us do this much better and really look forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Uh, and I want to um, acknowledge something that you said. Only when we come and engage and we see with our eyes, we have deep understanding as to what people are struggling with, what they expect for us, how we can serve. Um, I, um, as many of you are aware, I was for five years um, EU humanitarian and crisis commissioner, and at that time I had a front row seat to many of, actually, you in this room to the problems uh, you face. I vividly remember many of my uh, visits. I remember going to Somalia and uh, uh, landing with a tiny little plane and seeing the Toyota trucks with the uh, machine guns on top, on top of them and thinking, hmm, are these our friends or the other people? For me, it was one day for people in Somalia every single day uh, struggling with that um, danger that a conflict uh, brings. And I cannot tell you how happy I am that Somalia has turned a page. Um, and I, you know, obviously we, we hope the same uh, everywhere. In Libya, in Yemen, of course in Ukraine to see an end of this, uh, this uh, war. Um, in Sudan, well, if I go like this, I need to go South Sudan, <laughs> Nigeria, Northern part. Um, uh, but instead of doing that, I'm going to do my job, which is to give the floor to our next uh, speaker. And on behalf of the uh, G7+, Plus, uh, our next spe speaker is Minister Bangura uh, of, Sierra, of Sierra Leone. Minister Bangura, please, you take the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam MD, uh, and also MD from the World Bank, Anna Berge. Uh, excellencies, uh, I want to observe all protocols. Uh, I'm very delighted uh, to be with you here this morning uh, at this ministerial conference uh, on addressing fragility uh, and conflict um, as a global public good. Uh, the fragility that uh, has always been the breeding ground uh, for, for extreme poverty, uh, crisis, instability, and the fragility that has exposed uh, people's lives and livelihood uh, to shocks uh, that disproportionately impact uh, the settings uh, more than ever in, in our developing context. So uh, let me at the outset, uh, on behalf of my colleagues uh, in, in the G7 Plus, um, express uh, deep uh, condolences, but also commiserate uh, with the victims uh, of earthquakes uh, in, in, in Morocco here, but also in Afghanistan uh, and also in Nepal as well. All of these other countries that I think are, have been heavily impacted. And uh, we hope that humanity, uh, human solidarity will prevail and we guide in our collective efforts to help uh, the survivors, most of whom had already been living uh, at the last mile of resilience and development. So. Um, um, we, we are with you in this. Um, Madam Chair, um, globally we have been facing increasing incidents of um, natural and man-made crisis uh, on a scale that I believe is very unprecedented. 
uh, but also the frequency uh, that we have been seeing is something that requires everyone's attention. Uh, the impact has been pervasive um, across the world, but I believe the notion that no one is safe until everyone is safe is truer now than ever before. Um, however universal this impact might be uh, of the global challenges, I believe that our countries that have come together, we have an unfair disproportionate impact uh, in, in our own settings. Um, so especially in G7 uh, countries, whether it's pandemic, whether it's wars, but especially even wars in other countries like in Ukraine, uh, and, and their impacts, uh, climate change, but also other forms of economic depression. The statistics shows that uh, people in conflict affected countries feel the brunt of crises that are global or regional in nature more, more than others. So, and this is the, these countries are becoming the epicenter of uh, deeper poverty um, and all hunger, but also instability with rapid spillovers uh, way beyond their own borders. And uh, while collective actions and commitments can address the global challenges, we need, we need now, I think, very solid transformative policies and actions rooted in our shared understanding uh, of how we can address uh, this and build resilient and stability in these countries. So it is in this context that um, as chairing G7, Sierra Leone is seized of the opportunity today to advance our mutual understanding of fragility, as well as catalyze um, our new partnership to help uh, these states and our societies who are affected by repeated crises and converging risk. So on behalf of G7, I would like to just share, as you have requested, uh, three top a perspective on three top challenges, and I'll conclude with three approaches that we believe can help uh, your support to our countries. Uh, first uh, challenge is the increasing number of conflicts characterized by um, regime change, geopolitical tension, climate, as I've already said, induced competition, scarcity, that have been uh, reversing our gains in peace, stability, and growth, and are pushing already fragile countries further away from development. Uh, second is, is that while resilience has been uh, a high uh, issue on the agenda, uh, on the policy agenda, we still don't have, we believe, a framework that will allow us to properly assess complex risk of political geofragmentation, conflict, disaster, climate change, disease outbreak, but also economic shock, macro instability, death stresses, and how these risks overlap, but also compound uh, the problems that we face in addressing development in our countries. A uh, third uh, challenge that we see also is that aid efforts to address fragility, poverty, and policy stability have very often been uh, approached as a short lived. And I, I heard Anna really alluding to this in their assessments, in their strategy. Um, um, but also, uh, they are not only short lived, um, I think um, they are projectized, uh, not programmatic in a way. Um, and so, without much consideration, to the broader national context. So uh, the insufficient consideration to our vision of lasting peace um, and well-being have ampered our transition out of stability. So uh, in the face of these three key challenges, uh, uh, let me just um, wrap up by highlighting some of the three approaches that we think can help uh, in, in strengthening the strategies that have been developed by the two institutions. First, uh, we need a framework that recognizes uh, the type of resilience capabilities or capacity that we need to systematically build uh, our, our, our institutions uh, to address risk and increase, but all risk and crises, but also their root causes. Uh, we are calling for capacities to be formalized across our organizations, a shared language, but also approaches to resilience. Uh, too often, uh, we've seen conventional and need-based development solutions inadequate to apply um, to adequately apply to meet complex risk and crisis instead of focusing on resilient solutions. Uh, so it is in this context that we believe that that we welcome first the the the, the, the strategy by the fund um, and the ongoing actions to better understand the root causes uh, and drivers of risk and fragility, but also employ uh, I will call it uh, tailored meets uh, resilient solutions. Um, that will emphasize the partnership that we're trying to build, uh, bringing your staff closer uh, to, to our context on the ground, uh, greater proximity in our countries I think is important, but also enhance your surveillance in, in, in lending and lending and, 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 and capacity building tools. I've been part of the discussions during the, uh, these meetings, emphasizing how, how we value capacity support that these institutions are providing to us. 
There are often tensions between spending and savings um, during resilience, for resilience. And that is why we applaud your strategy, Madam um, um, MD from the IMF, that focuses on context-specific and tailored solutions um, to the diverse political, economic, and social uh, problems that we face in these countries. Um, and I want to applaud you uh, on some efforts that you have done in terms of mobilizing resources under the PRGT, and efforts you did on the crisis response facilities as well, um, and the CCRT, and the recent efforts you are making in, in making sure that our countries have access to RSC, but mobilizing resources towards those. I think they are suited to our context, and um, of course, the effort that you have made to advocate for more closing of the gaps uh, in, in, in those funding mechanisms. And we, we appeal to our partners as well to, to, to join in your call um, in ensuring that you are able to work with you, we are able to work with you to find balance between spending and savings uh, for resilience in our context. We are also pleased with the World Bank, and, and I want to thank Anna for highlighting the key areas of focus, prevention, resilience, and staying engaged uh, in, 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 in our context. Uh, but also, I think there's a strong appeal in the course of these meetings around putting the spotlight on IDA 21 and making sure that the fidelity comp component of IDA funding uh, receives uh, clear attention and it stays as, 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 a, as a conduit for supporting our case. M Secondly, many of our countries, um, I'll, I'll say here, face huge debt distress. Um, and, and it puts us uh, in a clear context on ensuring that we are credible uh, in, in honoring our obligations to partners that do lend to us, but it's, it leaves us um, trying to make the, the, the balance between spending for resilience and fragility while still continuing to pay debt. So we want to draw your attention um, to, to ensuring that uh, debt issues are actually innovative ways are found to addressing debt issues in fighter context. Um, I think our colleagues have been asking for thinking through innovative ways like swaps. Uh, debt for resilience swap mechanisms, maybe. I've had debt for health, debt for, but we were th thinking through innovative ways for addressing this. Third uh, approach that we are trying to advance as well, we recognize and commend both the IMF and the, and the World Bank, but also other partners that I think have been there with us, whether in context of displacements um, and, and the like, um, for reaffirming uh, the need to work with a wider range of others, other partners, and coordinating our government's partnership on resilience, sustainability, and growth. So it is in this context that we would like to call on our partners to deepen their commitment uh, to the principle of national ownership of these interventions, uh, and particularly government-led uh, country platform across our members in good ways of aligning our resources to our national strategies. Let me conclude, Madam uh, Chair, by reiterating the need for continuous, um, continued um, engagement and dialogue of this setting, I think we requested in April that we we'll, we'll think it is important to meet here in Morocco as well, and I'm very happy that this has been a very well attended meeting, but also join on other partners that I think are helping us, better humanitarian, bilateral, and other development partners in, in bringing them to the table and, and fostering the conversation. I am very much looking forward to uh, the deliberations this morning uh, that will set the course for our future actions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Bangura, for presenting in such a thoughtful and well-organized manner what the challenges are, how you prioritize when it is so tough to do so, and how we can be more uh, helpful. Uh, I will turn uh, next to uh, someone who spends all her time making sure that there is more resources and more help gets to people who otherwise would be hungry. Uh, this is the uh, executive director of the World Food Program, uh, Ms. McCain. Thank you. Uh, ministers, Excellencies, I want to thank you for inviting me to take part in this important conversation today. The world is facing an unparalleled hunger crisis fueled by conflict, climate change, COVID-19's uh, economic aftershocks, and stubbornly high inflation. At the World Food Program, we see the impact of this global crisis everywhere we work. 
Today, 345 million people are acutely hungry. They are in danger of starvation. Over 150 million of them are children under the age of 18. We know that these people are disproportionately located in the 40 countries classified as fragile and conflict-affected states. Many of these nations are gripped by concurrent and long-term crises that will continue to fuel global humanitarian needs for years to come. But this is happening just as funding for relief operations is drying up. In recent months, WP has been forced to make the agonizing decision to cut rations for tens of millions of vulnerable people. Nearly half of our 86 country operations have already reduced or soon plan to reduce the size and scope of our food and cash programs. This includes major humanitarian emergencies such as Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, and the Sahel region of West Africa. Unfortunately, it is a similar story right across the humanitarian system. This is our new operating environment. It's our new normal. Excellencies, in these exceptional times, it is critically important that we invest in programs to address the root causes of food insecurity in fragile countries. Hunger and fragility are, inter are interlinked, and when they are allowed to flourish, they undermine macroeconomic stability and security. So it is in everybody's interest that we prevent this from happening. As I always say, food security is national security. The International Monetary Fund's food shock window recognizes this reality, and it is providing valuable support to stressed communities in fragile nations, such as South Sudan, which I visited over the summer. WFP is proud to be an implementing partner for this innovative tool, working with governments and the IMF to ensure it makes a real difference on the ground. We, are, we, we also strongly support the IMF strategy for fragile and conflict-affected states. We welcome the opportunities it has created for, for more intensive and more ambitious partnerships between our organizations at the country level but there is still so much more that we can do together. The IMF, the World Bank, WFP, and Ministers of Finance. In Benin, for example, we have worked together to develop a social registry to ensure assistance is being targeted and delivered appropriately. We have also collaborated to use our school feeding program as a platform to support broader development in the country. And we are now exploring how to use school feeding to boost local agricultural production and support the resilience of national food systems in the face of climate change. If we leverage each other's expertise and step up our partnerships, we can ensure that investments in social protection programs supported by the IMF and World Bank are used to provide swift and effective support to the most vulnerable communities. WFP stands ready to lend our deep operational expertise and global reach in support of this critically important agenda. We are here to help all of you. It is not too late to halt the relentless growth in global humanitarian needs and increase resilience and food security in fragile and conflict areas. With determination, innovation, and above all, cross-sectoral collaboration, we can and we must rise to this collective challenge and bring new hope to vulnerable communities around the world. I thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, that very clear uh, statement. I want to draw two important points from it. The first one is the magnitude of the challenge. Not only the huge number of people, but the fact that we are going in the wrong direction. Rather than hunger going down, it is going up. 
and uh, that you have operations <coughs> in 86 countries. This is almost half of our membership. And secondly, what you said about addressing root causes and working together. We are not going to um, find a way for the world hungry to have food if there is no production at home, if we are not all uh, joining uh, forces. Hunger is the world's most important solvable problem. Uh, and I am uh, so glad you are at the helm of the World Food Program. That would help it to be solved. Um, I am now going to uh, turn to uh, Antoinette Sayer. She was finance minister in Liberia. First hand knowledge of what it means to operate in a fragile country, and now she's uh, a great.